Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americas. You know, the ones that Western history books spend about a page discussing. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all around the Americas for over 30 years now. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking like we're just having a beer together. Sometimes I'll tell stories of my adventures. Other times I'll share what I've learned about the various cultures that were here before Columbus. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast, Beholden the No One. I'm just having fun with it. I hope you do too. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and let's get started. Season 4, Episode 9, Earliest Peruvian Civilizations. This is the last episode of Season 4. I've just returned from 10 days traveling Peru's north coast, so this is a good month to talk about the amazingly old pyramids there. But first, a word about my use of the term civilization here. The terms civilization and culture get thrown around a lot in archaeology, and usually to indicate whether or not we should be impressed by them. I'm guilty of it, too. I would say hunter-gatherer culture versus industrialized civilization. But in this context, I'm referring to the first Peruvian communities that built large stone buildings and lived in groups that exceeded a thousand people. Arbitrary, I admit it, but that's what I'm going with here. The other thing to say from the start is that these earliest civilizations of Peru invented what they created. They had no examples to adapt, no older traditions to learn from. No one anywhere close had built a stone temple or really even a stone house. Some publications refer to them as pristine cultures, but whatever you want to call it, they invented, not adopted, their way of life. Okay then, let's get started with the five W's. Since my title starts with earliest, we'll start with when. I'll be talking about two major time periods, before and after ceramics. Those did get adopted, probably from Ecuador, but maybe from deeper in the Amazon. Ceramics started appearing in Peru about 1800 BCE, so that's our line. I'll talk about roughly 3500 to 1800 BCE in Part 2, and then 1800 to about 200 BCE in Part 3. That means that most of this history went on for thousands of years before the Romans even existed. Where? the river valleys along Peru's north coast, north of Lima, and the Andes Mountains directly above them to the east. Next, what? Basically, stone-built and adobe structures. They started about 3500 BCE and grew into cities of thousands of people. Not just a few cities, dozens of cities. And they were the first in the New World. Who? Well, this is one of the most interesting aspects. It's not just one kind of people. It's different communities working together. On the coast, it's fishermen. Up the rivers, into the fertile valleys, it's farmers. Up in the Andes, it's hunters. All of them were trading back and forth to create a more diverse resource base. And then there's a fourth player, people in the Amazon. They controlled vital resources, but like that guy in the booth in Deal or No Deal, we can't see them. Unlike the others, we don't have the sites in the Amazon, at least yet that is. I think we're finally starting to find them, but that's another episode. Finally, the hardest one to answer. Why? We can say that at least in part, it was about increasing their collective resource base. The people of the coast had fishing, but no adjacent places to farm. It's all sand there. Fertile lands were a few kilometers into the river valleys leading to the coast, 
But intensive agriculture with things like corn and potatoes hadn't started yet. Their crops alone couldn't feed a large population. And all the big game, like deer and llamas, were up in the mountains. Trading gave them all the ability to support larger populations and settle in the same place all year long. Anthropology calls that sedentary life. Basically, commerce was a big part of the why. Once we cross the 1800 BCE mark, a second reason takes hold. Religion. We see a shared religion spread along the coast from the highlands, one based on a deity with jaguar features. I believe, and it seems to make sense, that that came from the Amazon. Yes, I'm talking about my obsession with the fang deity. One more why. Why didn't we know about these early civilizations until very recently? Well, archaeologists found these cities over a hundred years ago. The father of Peruvian archaeology, Julio Teo, documented most of them in the 1920s and 30s. But finding no ceramics, no gold, no evidence of intensive agriculture, he abandoned them for more spectacular sites. And I don't blame him. The later sites are massive and full of incredible art. By the way, I love Julio Teo. He was amazing. He was born in a simple Quechua village, and he was the first ever indigenous archaeologist in Peru. He got a scholarship to do his doctorate at Harvard. He could have stayed in the U.S., but instead he returned to Peru and spent his life discovering the most important of his country's amazing archaeological sites. He deserves his own podcast episode, and someday I'll do that. Anyhow, 50 years after Teo's visits, archaeologist Michael Mosley returned to the area in the 1970s. He took those same facts, no gold, no ceramics, no corn, and said, wait a second, how old are these cultures? Remember, Teo's visits were before the advent of carbon-14 dating. He could only estimate site age through ceramic sequences, and there were no ceramics there. Mosley credited the intensive fishing on the coast as the reason those early sedentary cities developed. V. Gordon Child had stated that urbanism could not develop without intensive agriculture, but there was none there. So in 1975, Mosley published his theory. It was called The Maritime Foundations of Andean Civilization. It was a paradigm-shifting moment triggered not by discoveries in Egypt or Mesopotamia, but Peru. Okay, that sets the stage for us. I've got a lot to say in the next two sections, so I'll take my first commercial break here. When I return, we'll land in the Supe River Valley. By now, anyone listening knows how deeply involved I am in Maya calendar studies. I've made a website, an iPhone app, an annual wall calendar, and now I'm thrilled to announce the most complex Maya calendar tool I've ever made, barsanddots.com. I didn't actually make it, more like commissioned it. The coding was done by software engineer Matt Neal, and that code was based on the original Bars and Dots program created by Sid Hollander in the 1980s. Bars and Dots is the most sophisticated Maya calendar conversion program ever made, and it's free for anyone to use. And guess what? This is the 13th commercial I've made. That's got to be a good Maya calendar omen, right? Just log on to barsanddots.com and start playing with it. Peru's coast is lined with river valleys spilling into the Pacific Ocean. Each one of them are like mini fertile crescents with amazingly rich soils fed by rivers coming from snowmelt and glaciers in the Andes. They're perfect for intensive agriculture. Right along the coast runs the Humboldt Current, cold waters from the south and Antarctica. 
the cold waters produce a crazy abundance of fish. Those two environments right next to each other make for a natural resource paradise. Thousands of years of civilization rose and fell in those valleys, but never all occupied at once. Over the centuries, when society collapsed in one valley, the people would just pick up and move to another and start again. Peru's archaeological story is still evolving, but for now, it begins in the Supe Valley, about 200 kilometers north of Lima. We call that first civilization Corral Supe, for the valley and its biggest city, Corral. It's also called Norte Chico, but that term includes other valleys north and south of Supe as a collection. Supe was the first, but by the mid-2000s BCE, those other valleys had the same kinds of cities and population clusters. We really didn't know any of this until the carbon-14 dates of Corral were published in 2001. Yes, we had Mosley's work, which took place at the mouth of the Supe Valley, but he never realized that it was part of a larger exchange network. That was brought to light by Peruvian archaeologist Ruth Shade. Shade started her work in the Supe Valley in the 1990s and continues there to this day. We now understand that the Supe Valley had over 20 large pre-ceramic settlements, with Corral being the largest and probably the capital. At the coast, we have the site of Aspero, the fishing city studied by Mosley in the 1970s. Shade studied it further, realizing that the cotton fish nets were being made in Corral, 23 kilometers inland and traded for marine food sources like fish and mussels. I visited both Corral and Aspero last month. They had nice visitor centers and friendly staff members. Not to my surprise, my group and I were the only tourists there. In fact, that happens every time I go. It blows my mind that no one ever visits, but that's the fact. The guides at both sites were young, smart, enthusiastic folks, and both expressed great admiration for Ruth Shade. Not only did Shade do great archaeology, she clearly inspired pride in the local community. And it was wonderful to see that. So, okay, more about the sites. All of the valley's pre-ceramic sites, Aspero included, had pyramids and sunken circular plazas built of stone. They also had residential compounds with many rooms inside. Those were built of combinations of stone and adobe. At Corral, the residents of the city center were clearly eating better than the ones on the periphery, and that implies some sort of social hierarchy. We can't say that about Aspero yet because the peripheral structures haven't been excavated. In truth, it's a miracle that we have any of Aspero. When Shade first arrived, the whole site was covered by the local city trash dump. Under her direction, volunteers from the local community dug it out so archaeology could continue. All of the temples of Supe had a similar style, flat stone facades and rubble cores. The rubble cores were interesting. It was actually not just loose rubble, but big net bags full of rubble. The standard explanation is that those bags diffuse seismic shock during earthquakes and prevent the building from rocking apart. One of my group last month mentioned another theory, which I actually really like. A bag of rubble is a quantifiable quantity and could have been or represented a standard unit of measure for labor contribution. We know that Mita Corve labor was a core component of civilization going forward, so this might be another example that that was happening from the beginning. So sure, why not? I think that was a great idea. In just two buildings, one at Corral and one at Aspero, there were human babies found in that same rubble. Shade's team determined that they were sacrifices and called both those pyramids 
Waka de los Sacrificios. Perhaps they were, but I think it's equally possible that they were babies who died and their elite families interred them as offerings in a bereaved effort to give their death some kind of meaning. I prefer that explanation. Baby killing is a serious accusation, and one we shouldn't pin on these people without irrefutable proof. But moving on to trade evidence, the case is really very strong. Corral has irrigation canals, so they were definitely farming. The surprise is, their primary crop is not food, but cotton. Bags, baskets, sandals, nets, and much more were all made out of cotton. The nets were made for the fishermen of Aspero. Despite being 23 kilometers from the ocean, Corral's trash pits are full of fish bones and shells. That had to come from Aspero. The other small cities in Supe were also eating lots of fish, so it was a network. Starting just after 3000 BC, a few mountain communities were pulled into this trade circuit. The best known and excavated is named Kotosh. At a thousand meters above sea level, it had more rain, different plants, and big game animals. It too built temples and circular plazas but their trash pits were primarily the bones of hunted animals. Those same bones, in less quantity, are found at Corral, hence indicating that trade relationship. The thing that none of those pre-ceramic sites have, and it drives me nuts, is art. No public art, and barely any artifacts with surface art. Much of Peru's ancient art is on ceramics or metal jewelry but neither of those existed yet at Corral's times. What little Supe Corral art we do have appears on cotton textiles and objects made of bone. But even that tiny bit of art reveals an important thing, a connection to the Amazon. Multiple sites have images of monkeys, but there are no monkeys on the coast. Those are only from the Amazon. Even more telling, there are macaw and parrot feathers found. We still don't know where or why, but Supe Corral was definitely in contact with the Amazon. One other artifact type worth mentioning is spondylus shells. They're red, spiky shells that only live in warm water. Normally, they're only found as far south as Ecuador. Shade takes their presence in the Supe Valley as trade with Ecuador. Archaeologist Steve Bourget has another theory. He thinks it's about El Niños. When El Niño weather events come to Peru's coastal valleys, it's a disaster. Rain floods the communities and warm water replaces the cold Humboldt current. All of the normal fish go away and things like spondylus shells show up. Bourget has a list of marine animals that only show up during El Niños and finds them in ritual contexts. To his thinking, spondylus shells aren't exotic trade items. They're totems against the threat of El Niño. The Supe Corral model was a huge success. For over a thousand years, the population grows. At its peak, the Supe Valley had over 20,000 people. 5,000 of them were living in Corral's urban metropolis. Another 5,000 were in Aspero. Throughout the whole time, none of these communities had defensive walls or clear signs of aggression. In fact, I couldn't find any evidence of violence for Supe Corral until this last trip. I learned that at both sites, and it's yet to be published, they both have severed heads found in buried temple offerings. Not many, but enough. Scratch another peaceful society off the list. These guys were hurting each other and taking their heads off too. But violent or not, the whole valley is abandoned around 1800 BCE. Interestingly, that's exactly when ceramics arrived to the region. Ceramics themselves aren't life-threatening, 
But big technology changes like that often come with others and trigger new ways of living, and they also invalidate old ways of living. Personally, I'm not sure what happened, but I bet you Ruth Sade is trying to figure it out. All of Sade's work in Supe is great, but archaeologists seem to have forgotten that there are equally old sites 150 kilometers to the north in the Cosma Valley. The oldest site there is named Sachin Bajo. It's also huge, 37 hectares in size, and it starts about the same time as Kural, maybe as early as 3500 BCE. It also has pyramids, sunken circular plazas, and no ceramics or public art. And just like the Supe Valley, it has multiple farming communities trading with a big fishing city on the coast. There in the Cosma Valley, that fishing center is called Las Aldas. It's not open to tourism, but the nice folks of Cosma offered to take me there last month. I didn't have time this trip, but I'm definitely going there next time. Also like Supe, the Sachin civilization was trading with mountain communities. Galgada is the big one over there, dug by Terence Greeter in the 1970s. So we have the same time, same settlement pattern, same kind of trade network. The big difference was the Cosma Valley wasn't abandoned at 1800 BCE. Instead, they turned into a clearly war-oriented culture and built tall walls around their cities. I'll take my final commercial break here, and when I return, we'll talk about what happens after 1800 BCE. This break is where commercials should go, but until I find people who'd like to buy the time, I'll just promote what I'm doing. If you like the cultures and places I'm talking about in this podcast, you should consider traveling with my colleagues and I. I'm the director of Maya Exploration Center, a nonprofit dedicated to the better understanding of ancient American civilizations. We do that through things like this podcast, our website, public lectures, and educational travel programs like I just mentioned. If you'd like to find out more about how to get involved, or just give us a donation to continue our work, check us out at www.mayaexploration.org. That's mayaexploration.org. About 1800 BCE, ceramics begin on the north coast of Peru. Old chronologies call it the transition between the late formative and initial periods. It's worth noting that those ceramics started out complex, not rudimentary like first tries. Beautiful pieces from the very start. The people of the coast learned the technology from somewhere else, probably the Valdivia culture of Ecuador, but perhaps from the Amazon. Both areas were making ceramics hundreds of years earlier, and Valdivia actually learned it from the Amazon. The stirrup vessel form was first developed about 1800. It's a really complex form with a double neck spout on the top. We call the first civilization that made those Cupus Nike. Starting around 1500 BCE, Cupus Nike sites spread across northern coastal Peru, from Lima almost all the way to the border of modern Ecuador. They were in river valleys and in the mid-range of the Andes. Kotosh, the highland city trading with Supe Corral, turned into a Cupus Nike site. In terms of architecture and settlement patterns, Cupus Nike aren't very different from Corral. Pyramids, residential sectors, irrigation canals for agriculture, even a few sunken circular plazas were built. But finally, Cupus Nike gives me what I want, art. We see it in the ceramics, and they display it in public places. The most famous Cupus Nike site is in the foothills east of Trujillo. It has a terrible name, 
caballo muerto. That's dead horse in Spanish. Its main temple is called Huaca de los Reyes, the Shrine of the Kings, a much better name. The entire front face of that temple is covered in giant adobe molded faces, each over two meters tall. And guess who it is? It's my friend the Fang Deity. For those of you who haven't heard my rants about him, he's the jaguar-like deity that appears in the art of virtually every Peruvian civilization after this, starting with these Kupasnike images. The same deity is depicted on Kupasnike ceramics as well. Lots of them. My favorite Kupasnike stirrup vessel depicts a jaguar lying down in a patch of San Pedro cactus, an Amazonian cat, and the hallucinogenic cactus from the coast. I'll put that one in my show notes so you can look at it. Kupasnike is the name for the civilization spreading out at the time, but it's connected to a very famous ancient site called Chavin de Huantar. That site was first investigated by Julio Teo in 1919. He recognized how old it was. At the time, it was the oldest known city in Peru. He proclaimed it, and the culture he named Chavin, the mother culture of Andean civilization. And until Ruth Jade's work at Corral, that was pretty much what everybody thought. Opinions about the start date of Chavin de Quantar are frustratingly all over the place. Teo thought it was starting about 850 BCE, but that was way too young. Others have argued it starts at 3000 BCE, but that's too old. Middle of the road opinions range from 1800 to 1200 BCE. Most archaeologists today narrow it down to maybe 1500 to 1200 BCE. Honestly, I'm not sure what the issue is. Would somebody please go there and dig a few test pits and get us some solid dates? Of course, I'm joking. And the truth is that Chavin de Huantar is not an easy site to get to. It's at 3200 meters above sea level. That's 10,500 feet and it's only accessible by frighteningly curvy mountain roads. I brought my group there last month, but it was seven hours by bus from the coast and seven more hours back down to Cosma. Its location is said to be the easiest path from the coast to the Amazon. But if that's the easiest way, I don't ever want to see the hard way. It was my first time to the site, and I was thrilled to be there. I had been reading about this place for 30 years, and there I was standing in its plaza. Anyhow, Chavin was a very different place, unlike anything before. For one thing, it was way up in the mountains. And for another, its public spaces were full of carvings. And those carvings were clearly inspired not by the coast, but by the Amazon. There were some coastal-influenced pieces, like spondylus shells and San Pedro cactus, but much more Amazonian stuff. The animals represented were crocodiles, big snakes, monkeys, parrots, and of course jaguars, all Amazonian creatures. On the largest monuments, it was one figure again and again, that fanged deity. He's on the Raimundi stone, the patio stone, the Teo obelisk, and the most famous Chavin monument, El Lanzon. Teo called him the principal deity. Elizabeth Benson is the one that called him the fang deity, and that's who I get it from. The sides of the temple had tall walls full of what we call tenon heads. They were heads sticking out of the wall, anchored in place by long stone tenons mounted deeply into the wall, hence that term tenon head. Each head is different. Some are men, some are jaguars, and most are men transforming into jaguars. Most every scholar agrees. They are Amazonian-style shamans transforming into jaguars. 
The site's museum has a display with a line of them showing the full transformation from human to jaguar. It's awesome. I'll put my recent photo of it in the show notes as well. In the Amazon today, shamans snuff ayahuasca powder to initiate their transformations and visions. When they do, long strands of snot pour out of their noses. A few of those tenon heads are carved with the same thing, snot pouring out of their nostrils. So, at least to my eyes, Chavin de Quantar is the first place where the clear picture of an emerging religion takes place. To summarize, we have a city located at the center point of a route between the coast and the Amazon, but full of Amazonian imagery. Its exterior walls are covered in imagery of humans transforming into jaguars, a practice well documented in Amazonian shamanism. And we have clear evidence of a principal deity, one with jaguar fangs and claws and snakes emanating from his head and waist. So we've got all that. In addition, we have strong evidence of Chavin de Quantar's purpose as a pilgrimage site. There are labyrinths under its temple that were found with piles of grouped objects from far away, predominantly from the coastal communities. Things like pottery, marine shells, animal bones. People were coming from afar to pay homage to this shrine and returning to their communities with new knowledge. That is demonstrated by the profusion of images of the Fang deity found in all those Kupa Snike sites. And starting around 900 BCE, his image starts showing up in the Paracas region, hundreds of kilometers to the south of Lima. To me, it's clear as a bell that a new Amazon-inspired religion was taking hold of the Andes and the coast by about 1500 BCE. Chavin de Huantar's end, at least as a religious pilgrimage site, comes somewhere around 300 BCE. The circumstances of that collapse are interesting. Through most of its existence, it had one of those circular sunken patios at its center, the same kind that Corral had. The main difference was that it was covered with images of the Fang deity, also his bird assistants and a few Amazonian animals are in there. But around 500 BCE, Chavin does a massive remodel, replacing the old temple with a much larger one that we simply call the new temple. This new temple had a U-shaped design and made the new focus a sunken rectangular plaza. Whatever triggered that redesign didn't work, because by 300 BCE, there were humble houses being built in that new sunken plaza. And those houses are an important clue. They mean that the site was not just abandoned, but whatever it meant to the local people ceased to matter. It was now just open land to build on. Now, preparing for this podcast, I saw something that I had never really noticed. My attempt to draw a chronology chart teased it out. I've explained how this new, or at least finally detectable, religion swept along the coastal river valleys through Kupasnike culture. But there was one valley where it did not take hold at all, the Cosma Valley. That's where, when Corral Supe collapsed at 1800 BCE, Sachin civilization kept going. Post-1800 BCE, after a brief downturn, the city of Sachin Bajo actually expanded into a much larger settlement, and it did so still working with its fishermen partners at Las Haldas. Also, new cities popped up nearby. Sachin Alto and Cerro Sachin were the biggest. There's also one called Moshike. Each of those had thousands of inhabitants. Sachin Alto grew to cover over 300 hectares, which is five times larger than Corral ever was. 
These Cosma Valley cities also had pottery and stone carvings, but I can't find a single example of the Fang deity from any of them in that early period. Instead, Cerro Sachin looks and feels like a fortress. It had high walls surrounding its main compound, with carvings of warriors, captives, and severed body parts covering every wall. Chavin de Huantar and the Cupus Nike sites had no such walls or warrior imagery. It's really quite striking at Cerro Sachin. Warriors grimace while brandishing weapons, there are tied captives, and there are severed heads on stakes. There's also a lot of random severed body parts. You see just arms and legs or guts. Flanking the front doors are carvings of angry-looking warriors and stacks of severed heads. The message is pretty clear. Go away or we'll kill you. What was going on there? Did they reject the Fang Deity Club? I think that's exactly what happened. Cosma was the only place that lived through the 1800 BCE shakeup, and I think they kept their cosmological views too. I think they were the last holdouts against the new religion, and that they got violent about it. Whatever was pissing them off, Sachin didn't last much longer than Chavin de Huantar. Both were gone by 200 BC at the latest. When civilization picks back up again, a century later, it's the Moche civilization. And who were they? Violent warriors who worshipped the Fang deity. It's like they all got together and said, Hey guys, we don't have to choose violence or religion. We can be violent in the name of religion. And thus, another authoritarian organized religion graced our planet. That combination of violence and religion ruled the coast for another 800 years. Okay, that's a wrap for Season 4 of Archeo-Ed. As I hope you're aware, I take a break during the summers. That's when I do most of my traveling. Archeo-Ed Season 5 will start on September 1st. For those of you who stick with me on Patreon... I'll be posting an exclusive video sometime in the middle of the summer. It's the lecture that I just presented to my group as I traveled through Peru. I called it The Fang Deity Emerges, and I'm going to clean it up and put it out just for my Patreon audience this summer. So please stick with me. I've got more great things coming. As I wrap up this season, by the way, ArcheoEd is about to cross the 100,000 download line. We're actually doing it. With your help, we are making normal archaeological podcasts, not fantastic ones, something popular that people want to listen to. Thank you so much for that. For now, and for the summer, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support Archeo Ed through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2023.